we always start these out by sort of talking about the person's journey. And when I moved out here in 99 or so, you know, Benchmark was a very famous firm, and you were already one of the tall guys, as Randall Strauss said, doing deals. So I don't know much about the early Bill Gurley days. Okay. Um, so I grew up in Texas. Mm -hmm. And the reason I grew up in Texas is, is worth, there you go, is worth <laughs> telling because um, my father grew up on a farm in rural North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And when he was in his teen years, he fell in love with, with planes, with, with uh, motorized planes. And he would stay up till all hours of the evening working on these planes. I've, when my grandfather was alive, I went back to that house and he had this little shed out back. And um, my grandfather told this story then. He went from there, even though his father only had a sixth grade education, to NC State and got an aeronautical engineering degree, went to work at Langley Air Force Base. And three months after getting there, um, NASA was commissioned, and mm -hmm. they took the people from, Na from Langley and made them part of NASA and said, you're moving to Houston. Wow. And so I grew up a, a Texan primarily because of Lyndon Johnson's pork barrel politics, I think, that, <laughs> that ended up putting NASA right there um, in Houston. So um, it was, and then of course, you know, pretty amazing, you know, 11 years later, they put a man on the moon, and every single one of the fathers on my street where I grew up worked at NASA. It was just part of the culture. It's like, because mm -hmm. we lived right right near there. My uncle worked at NASA. Is that and, right? Yeah, Alan Lacey. I don't know if you knew him. I, he had some wild daughters. I hope you did not know him. No, I didn't know him. <laughs> but um, Gene Kranz, who Ed Harris played in the movie, lived down the street from us. I went to school with all of his daughters. Mm -hmm. And so it was interesting, you know? And I think when, I remember at one point in 99, during the bubble where everything was ludicrous, um, my dad tried to draw a parallel between the 10-year run they had and kind of the 10-year run to, that, that we had been on. Right. Um, but then that crashed, so that went away. <laughs> <laughs> well, and certainly the early days of Silicon Valley were really stoked by the space race. I mean, a lot of the chip companies and transistor companies. Sure. I mean, a lot of that sort of whole Russian space race was yeah. a lot of what drove this early Yeah, and, and, and as people have written, it's hard to imagine on this earth another kind of calling that has a similar type feel. I think people are working on a few, but it's hard to it's hard to go back in time and imagine what that was like, what that draw was like. Right. So anyway, that's why I grew up in Houston. Um, I got pulled into technology like almost every other panelist you had on, on this pan, uh, up here before um, by playing around with a computer. So mm -hmm. I, mine was a VIC-20, um, which you plugged into a, a television, and <laughs> mine didn't have any memory. So I would get these uh, magazines that had game, like in basic, just the code was in the magazine. And I would type it in, but if someone turned off the, the computer, well, it went away. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'd spend like four hours typing this thing in. And then, you know, as long as it was plugged in, I was okay. Um, but usually I would make typos while I was typing in the code. And so I learned basic just by going in and finding the typos and kind of reverse engineering what had gone wrong. <laughs> so, but uh, that story sounds like I hear it every single time. Someone yeah. adds some computer. Yeah, everyone always, day. there's always basic involved. And then <laughs> my sister went to Rice as a double E and um, her, she was employee 63 at Compaq mm -hmm. and she was four years older than I was. So I then, you know, she had options and Compaq was a huge success at it in its day. Um, and so that was another little data point that started pulling me mm -hmm. in the direction of where I am today. And so how did you, you were always on the finance side of it, right? Um, no. So okay. um, I went to, uh, to college at the University of Florida. And apparently there's some gators over here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I was, I, part of why I went there was I had an opportunity to walk on the basketball team and then I actually got a scholarship, although Admittedly, I played very little. I was mostly a practice player, but it was really cool. You weren't very good. Well, You're like the tallest guy, and you weren't good. Relative, I mean, D1 ball is like serious stuff. It's <laughs> like, I mean, like one in a thousand high school players gets at that level. So I still I, would have expected better. Okay, well, luckily, <laughs> luckily, I, I did just fine in school and other activities, so I could li live past that moment. But, um, but I had a computer engineering degree from there. Okay. And um, went to Compaq. Okay. back where my sister was, and originally started helping with problem solving. Then I got put on this team that I really loved, which was, it was like a Red Adair fire put out team. And when new products were launching and they were failing in the lab, we would come in and work 
like 24 hour shifts to try and figure out what was wrong with the design, mm. um, which was, it was invigorating. But the problem was, you know, two years in, I started my third project. So it was like the 386.33 and the 386.50, and then like it was gonna be the 486.25. It was just the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I had started reading, it, it, all this dates me, but like Byte Magazine and PC Magazine, and I could see that there was a bigger world than just working on this one system. Um, and so I went to business school at Texas, and there we go. We got a lot this of. This is like of, this is your life, Bill <laughs> Gurley, over in this corner. <laughs> um, and then, while I was at Texas, um, two things happened. Well, even before I got to Texas, I fell in love with stocks. I used to have trade stocks on Prodigy <laughs> um, before before the internet, and. Um, and I started reading a lot, and I started reading business magazines. When anyone, if anyone here has been to business school, everybody immediately starts reading Forbes and Fortune and Inc. I went to visit Austin Ventures, and I don't remember who I talked to there, but I decided I wanted to be a venture capitalist. And they told me, kid, don't even think about it. Go work for 20 years, you know, put it out of your mind. And what year was this? Um, that was eight, uh, 90. Right. 90. So this is back when like venture capital was this thing that the broader public had no understanding of. They were, you know, relatively small money firms. There yeah. were no billion dollar funds. Yeah. And I had, like I said, I had a little bit of it just from my sister having been at Compaq and, and reading about, you know, Kleiner Perkins being an investor and Ben Rosen, Rosen. Uh, and so I, I then um, st started reading these magazines and these guys kept being, kept being quoted talking about tech companies. And it was this power team at Goldman back in the day. It was Rick Sherlin mm -hmm. and Dan Benton uh, and a few others. And so I said, well, then I'll go do that. If I can't be a venture capitalist, I'll go do that. And so I went up in the summer to New York, having never been to New York before in my life, and just begged for meetings, um, just begged anyone that would talk to me. I ended up talking to Rick Sherlin and Dan Benton, which I was shocked that I could mm -hmm. get in. Um, and a guy named Al Jackson at First Boston took a liking to me and um, come, so I didn't get a job that summer. I ended up going to work at, at AMD, working on a 29K, which is an embedded processor. And, but I kept in touch with Al Jackson. I kept pestering him. And come like February 5th or something, he called me and said, we've got a spot for you. And I had no other job like lined up whatsoever. I don't know where I'd be today had Al <laughs> Jackson not taken a chance. And, um, as, as the story progresses, the serendipity gets more unreal. So uh, uh, another thing you hear a lot from people is how lucky these windows opened up. And right. so um, when I arrived at First Boston, so most of you probably don't know what a, the sell side analyst world is like, but um, in, in most firms you start as a junior and then you work your way up to an associate and then you, know, you wait for the person above you to die or lose their job so that you can get promoted. Two firms back then had this trial by fire ideal, which is they would take an MBA student and say, you're an analyst, mm -hmm. boom. And First Boston was one of those places. As I arrived, a guy named Charlie Wolf, who is one of my mentors and someone I owe a lot to and is still practicing the art today, decided he was gonna retire and just teach other analysts. They were originally gonna have me cover the embedded or like the passive component industry. I don't even know what that is. It's like um, <laughs> resistors or something. And I wanted to cover the PC industry because I knew it because I'd worked at Compaq. And he retired and I went back to my, uh, my apartment, which is on the fourth floor of a walk up and I didn't have an air condition yet and it was summer in New York. And I uh, sweated while I typed out my thoughts on the industry all weekend. Mm -hmm. And so I went into the, to Al Jackson who ran, I said, you've got to give me the sector, you've got to give me the sector, which he did. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, like six weeks later, I'm visiting Compaq and I'm 27 or something, and I'm going up to see Ecker Pfeiffer and the CFO. Uh -huh. And I had been a lowly engineer like at the bottom of the company, which was surreal. I don't know, what, uh, the most surreal thing about the sell-side analyst job is you are, are placed in this level of importance that probably you don't deserve, but it's just right up top. Um, and so, Literally within a month or two of me getting that job, the top three analysts, including Charlie, all retired. A guy mm -hmm. named David Kors and Dan Benton 
who, who I'm still friends with today. In fact, I saw him at, uh, just this week at the Fortune Conference. And they all became my friends. So Dan was at Goldman, and David was at Kidder Peabody, and Charlie was at my firm, and they gave me all their models. Mm -hmm. So here are the top three people just get out of the way and, and then offer me help. Um, and you can't, <laughs> like that kind of serendipity, you can't. You know, I'm so thankful to all of them. Um, and it made it easier for me to shine because they were out of the way. And some of them I borrowed ideas from. So David Corris um, is the guy who gave me the idea for Above the Crowd, which I'd started 20 years ago or something like that, which is hard to believe. It started as a fax. Mm -hmm. um, and he was doing a, a weekly newsletter as a sell site analyst where he was so pejorative, it was unreal. He would simply... <laughs> He, he made up nicknames for all the high-tech executives, and he was just, like, making fun of them. And the buy side, who is the customer of the sell side analyst, loved him for it. Mm -hmm. One of the things I had done um, right when I got there is I asked all the salespeople to give me the phone number of their, their best account, who, and I asked if I could get five minutes, and I just called them and said, what are you looking for in this role? How can I do better? And they all loved this guy, Chorus, for his irreverence, which mm -hmm. was interesting. Anyway, that gave me the idea for Above the Crowd. Um, funny story about that. I got invited to Agenda in 93. So this was Stuart Alsa. It was the big conference of the day. Right. And it was hard to get into. There were only about 300 people there. And you show up, and Gates is there, and Allison's there. And you're like, he's right here. You know, he's like, I'm <laughs> 27 years old. I couldn't believe it. I was just floored to even be in their presence. And I don't know if it was the first one I went to or the second one, but they were selling the first Palm Pilot. And they were selling it for like 100 bucks or something. But inside of it was the contact information for all 300 attendees. Uh -huh. And so I ran some math in my head. I said, that's 33 cents a customer. And so <laughs> I bought that thing, and I uploaded it, and I put them all on the above the crowd list and spammed them. <laughs> um, the top 300 executives in high tech, um, without their permission. Uh, I, um, and one of the things David Kors had taught me, at the time, um, Wall Street was encouraging their analysts not to disseminate their reports. They wanted to keep it controlled so they could charge for it through trading. And what David taught me was the more influence you have by having more broad distribution, the better it's going to be for your career. Mm -hmm. And so that, and which is, I think, still today probably why I, why I blog, but that's what started the whole thing. Now, were you more or less irreverent and above the crowd when less you were faxing David. it out? David, David was great. Oh, I, just the faxing? I don't know. No one seemed to get uh, offended. They may not have known until right now. <laughs> um, no, but I mean in your irreverence. Like, were you, you no, were less I was than not. Him. He was so irreverent. Like, the, the, the problem with playing the game the way he did was, um, like, they couldn't bank anybody. Like, you know, mm. you, he, he cut off like a whole section of, of constituents who were important to his bank. Uh huh. So I didn't play it that way. I, I, I tried to be clever and uh, put a few musical quotes in, but that's what I did. Were you more, more irreverent than you are today on your blog? I'm not that irreverent. Am yeah, I? I know. I wish you were more. <laughs> no, okay. Um, one day. One Make day. Nicknames. Same problem. Same problem. <laughs> um, so, anyway. Um, things went really well. I got very lucky because these three guys got out of the way. And uh, my second year, I, I made the investor, uh, all, all, institutional investor all-American list, um, which was, you know, two years in, in my 20s. And um, it, time went by. Everything went great. I got to know a lot of great people. I, I got to meet Bill Gates. I, I followed Microsoft. Um, I followed Dell during their heyday and got very lucky. Um, one of my mentors was the food analyst. This is a strange story. So he had adopted this valuation methodology called return on invested capital that McKinsey had been pushing. And he told me about it. He said, you should look at this for your companies. And I ran the numbers on Dell, and they were like 20x better than anyone in the industry. And it was because of the way their inventory model worked and their negative cash conversion cycle. And at the time, they were in the hurt locker. They had had this option scandal, and their laptops were catching on fire. Um, like without anyone wanting them to. And, <laughs> and the stock was trading at like six times earnings. And so we'd run this math, and this food analyst had helped me. And he's like, that's incredible. And so we went out with a strong buy at, uh, at a price that ended, it ended up going up 100x, I, obviously because of what Michael and his team did. Um, but, but that call probably was the big event in my analyst career 
because at that, after that, a lot of the uh, buy side people paid a lot of attention to what we did. Mm -hmm. um, and that was because of listening. And I, maybe if we have time, I'll come back to, I've been studying this notion of far analogies, um, which is a, a, a different topic, but you know, learning from a food analyst and then applying it somewhere else is an interesting uh, mm -hmm. example of that. So eventually I got bored with that, and I, that maybe that's something that one How of did my you get, why did you get bored with it? Because it sounds like you fell in love with the stock industry. Yep. It sounds like you were having a lot of fun. I mean, yep. I can imagine you and, and meeting 20s a lot of people. Feeling like, getting, like, like you were, yeah, yeah, this was your absolutely. dream job and you had made it. The sell side analyst job, and it's changed since I was there, but it's a really weird one where you have about, I added them up one, there's like eight different constituencies from CEOs to hedge funds to value funds to your sales desk to your trading desk to your banker. And they all expect you to behave in a way that's op optimized towards them. Mm -hmm. And you can't. In fact, the only way you can kind of have power is to kind of break a little glass in every direction, yet be kind to everybody. Mm -hmm. So you have this tension. I always, the, the end of uh, do the right thing where he throws the trash can <laughs> through the pizza joint, that, that meant a lot to me because he just had to prove yeah. th that he you know, was dis disloyal a little bit to, to the pizza owner. And, and, that had to happen constantly, and it just made it, it made it less fun than it would be otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, and you've read about the tension between banking and research. All that was real, very real at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was about to go to work, and it's more, more, more surreal opportunity. So I was about to go to work on the buy side. I'd been interviewing and thought that's where I'd wanted to go. And I got a cold call from Frank Quattrone, mm -hmm. who I'd never met before. And um, after I talked to Frank, I called Roger McNamee, mm -hmm. who I had known because Roger was trading public-private back then at Integral. This was the days when Roger wore a suit and had short and hair. And I had met him first, actually, at T-Row because I think he was at T-Row before mm -hmm. he'd gone to Integral. And um, he said, whatever Frank says, you, you have to take time. He's like the biggest guy ever. I said, okay. So I went and met with Frank. And um, Frank said, I'm leaving Morgan Stanley. We're going to start a new investment bank called Deutsche Morgan Grunfeld, which no one will ever remember. Um, <laughs> and he said, I want you to come join us. And I told him, I said, I'm really burned out on this analyst thing. And he said, well, what do you want to do long term? This is a true story. Um, and I said, I would love to be a venture capitalist one day. And Frank said, come to work for me. Cover any sector you want. I'll move you out to Silicon Valley and introduce you to every venture capitalist that I know. And to boot, he added, he added a little salary incentive <laughs> on top of all that. Um, and so, you know, you'll hear different stories about people's loyalty to Frank, but he followed through on every single word. And I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for him. So he's, wow. uh, he's, he's good in my book by a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so I came out here. We picked, I decided they were, some of these are esoteric sell side things, but they were going to merge the PC industry with the big box. So I was going to have to pick up DEC and HP and Unisys or something, which was very uninteresting to me because I decided I just really love the edge, innovation, the edge. And so that wasn't going to be any good. So I told Frank, I'll cover the Internet, this new sector that no one knows anything about. Mm -hmm. And for the first three or four weeks, I was like just figuring out that I didn't know anything. And what year was this? Um, 96. Mm -hmm. And so I've come up with this graph, I, I wish I had a chalkboard, but where you, you, you put on one axis what you know and one what you think you know, and it's a you. And, <laughs> and when you start doing something you don't know anything about, the first partial learning causes more anxiety than confidence, because mm -hmm. you're just like realizing you don't know anything. And it probably took me eight to 10 weeks before I felt good about having done that, right. because I was so overwhelmed. And I had some great meetings. Um, like the first, second day in, they took me to the caboose that was seen at mm -hmm. with Halsey and Shelby. And I knew nothing. And uh, Shelby was so patient with me knowing nothing <laughs> about CPMs or page views. Like, I didn't know anything about media. And he just, he, he just sat there and walked. I think Halsey was a little more irritated. But Shelby, <laughs> Shelby put up with it, um, which I'm gracious for. And, and so, you know, that team, it, it, was, it, was, it was really weird because we had the most powerful banking team in Silicon Valley attached to what was a third tier investment bank in New York, the uh, arm of Deutsche Bank that no one knew anything about. And it was really uh, unstable uh, from that standpoint. But despite that, um, a combination of my work, 
a guy named Jeff Blackburn, who's head of Corp Dev and many other businesses at Amazon right now, and Frank and Bill Brady, um, one named mandate for the Amazon IPO. Mm -hmm. we, we were the lead manager, uh, even though we were Deutsche Morgan Grunfeld. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you a great story about that. So um, first of all, investment bankers, their favorite thing to do is insert slides at the very last minute. And back then, you used paper decks. So they had to use these, uh, these things that had the clips in them so they could open them up and insert these slides they decided they needed at the last minute. My assistant, my, just a, my admin assistant, Juliet Wilson, had come up with this idea that we should bind the pitch book, which mm -hmm. I still have a copy of today. And she found a place in San Francisco that was open 24 hours that would bind for you. Mm -hmm. And the bankers wanted nothing to do with this idea because it would mean they couldn't <laughs> insert anything at the last minute. Um, but we talked them into it, and she drove up here at like 2 or 3 in the morning, and we presented the pitch book as a bound, like canvas-bound book. Uh -huh. um, which was, I mean, it's a bit of hijinks, but still. Um, <laughs> like to, I'd like to think it played a part. Um, so anyway, that obviously was fantastic. So, t I mean, how was, what was Jeff Bezos like in those days? Um, you know, very similar to, I mean, the only difference between him then and him now is we all know what he's accomplished, so you probably think about him differently. Mm -hmm. But I remember my engagement with him back then, you know, the, the exact same enthusiasm, the big laugh, um, just inquisitive is all get out. Um, very thoughtful in a one-on-one -on -one situation to make it clear that he's listening and paying attention. Mm -hmm. um, and was very intent on you know, the long term. I remember he asked me to come speak to his employees about what it would mean when the stock went public and how they should think about stock prices because he was worried that they were going to get over infatuated or not or that it would change their work ethic. Mm -hmm. um, and he just, he was driven and uh, very impressed. I was very impressed from the beginning. I had no expectation that, uh, that it obviously would go this far. And in fact, on the night of the pricing, um, Jeff was pushing very aggressively for them to put it higher and higher. He didn't want the first day pop because that wasn't good for his business. Right. Uh, he wanted the money at the cheapest possible price. And back then, you know, f the bankers would call the analysts to see if they were okay with this. And, and it, it meant you were going to have to cover, you know, if the stock went down, people were going to ask you about it. And so I was nervous about it, which Frank remembers every time I see him to this day, because we were arguing over 17 or 19, and the equivalency today is <laughs> like so many times off the chart. Um, but anyway, it was, it was, it was a you know, very special time. And then I was at a conference, I don't remember where, but Ann Winblad came up to me and said, um, we'd like you to join us. Mm -hmm. And Frank, meanwhile, had introduced me to a bunch of firms, including Benchmark, where I'd gone in and had lunch several times. And it turns out that, that um, Gates had suggested this idea to her back, because they used to yeah, date they were, way, yeah. way back then. And, um, and so Bill I, Gates had recommended that's you. That's what the, she said. Like, I, I I've never it, talked to Bill about that. I find that. it interesting how many people had to work to make you a I know. That's what I'm saying. It's like ridiculous. <laughs> I feel, like, I feel like very I'm, lucky that all this happened. Pretty soon Jesus Christ is going to call John I know. I, somebody was looking after me. So um, I said yes like before she finished asking the question. <laughs> so I had wanted to be a VC for so long. And, like, I, you know, and I think... Two weeks later, I was at a conference, and Andy Ratcliffe came up to me, who's a, one of the founders of Benchmark. He says, why didn't you call us? And I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> so I just, I hadn't thought about, like, asking around. I, you know, I'd always considered it. I'd been listening. I had that Austin Ventures guy in my head that said you could never get into this. So um, about 18 months later, um, the Benchmark guys came after me, and I just had, I, I, I love John Hummer and Ann and respect them. And, think the world that they got me into the business, but the cultural fit with this team at Benchmark was really special. So in what sense, and what was different about Hummer Winblad? Well, nothing against Hummer Winblad, but um, Benchmark, the founders, had worked at other venture firms, and most venture firms are hierarchical, which means, that, much like I had talked about the equity analysts, there's the legendary people that have been there for 30 years, and then there's this, the what do they call them, like managing partners, and then there's the senior partners and junior partners. And two of the benchmark, three of the benchmark founders had been at these types of firms and felt like the young people were doing most of the work in the, 
the senior people were taking most of the economics and that that not only was unfair, but it created a horrible political environment mm -hmm. where people were gunning for one another because every time you would raise a new fund, you'd sit down and argue over who got what economics because mm -hmm. it got changed at every fundraise. And so they decided that they were going to come up with a new model, which they, they deemed the equal partnership, where everyone gets the exact same economics. And Benchmark was founded on that principle, and it's still, I think, the thing that differentiates us most today. And we believe, you know, creates just an enormous amount of teamwork and drive and, and, you're, and even peer pressure. You know, I remember thinking, boy, Kegel brought eBay here. How hard do I have to work to make up for that? Yeah. Um, and, and so I just think it's a much better model. We think it's much better. But that's, and so when you're being invited into something that is like that, it, it feels special. You know, mm -hmm. and I think it's one of the advantages we have recruiting today in that you're offering someone an equal seat at the table. Mm -hmm. eBay was such a transformative. We're, we're switching us to these mics. Oh. oh, just yours. Oh, just mine. Uh, you're special. I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> oh, you remember to turn it off. Very yeah, good. We've got a big lecture backstage. Um, so uh, what, eBay was such a transformative thing for Benchmark that yep. you know, really put it on the map. And you know, in some ways, you know, made Benchmark you know, a little bit like the Andreessen Horowitz of its day. I mean, it was a new firm that kind of came out of nowhere and typically it takes a really long time. And there is sort of the staying power of brands in yep. the venture capital business. Yep. Um, what was it like to go there as a firm? And do you see parallels between either what, you know, Redpoint was another one of these, yeah, yeah, yeah. or Andreessen Horowitz today? So it's interesting. If you talk to the limited partners who are the people that invest in venture funds, you'll hear them say that they like to hold about 10% of their allocation for first time funds. Mm -hmm. And their theory is that there's just so much more at stake when someone kind of plants a flag and says, I'm going to be successful, especially because. If they don't have good returns out of that fund, then there's not going to be a second or third or a fourth. Right. And they like that dynamic. They like that hustle. I mean, they don't just give it to three random people that walk in and say, we have a first-time fund. Mm -hmm. um, but in, in our case, or in Dreesen's case, or Redpoint's case, these people had a pedigree or a track record. Um, and I think, obviously, I already talked about serendipity. The venture business is just, you know, I can't tell you how much serendipity is involved in this game because everyone's searching for this kind of breakout thing and you don't know when you make the investment which ones are going to go which way mm -hmm. so but you know people there's enough of people doing it that there's going to be some where that happens and um, when it does it's exciting it was it was a crazy time it's funny because i mean i look in the room and so many of the entrepreneurs today like have no memory of 99 Mm -hmm. And 99 was crazy, but 01 was really crazy, too, mm -hmm. um, in the opposite direction. So yeah. we went from a party where no one could lose and everyone got paid to one that felt like, you know. No one could win. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, it was just horrible. Um, yeah, and, and those learnings, um, both of them, were, I think, were really compelling and interesting to go through. Yeah. But I don't think a lot of people today don't have any muscle memory from that time. Well, and Benchmark changed so much as a firm during those times. I mean, so, you know, I was only looking at this from the media side, but I remember you guys went from, you know, 99 or, you know, maybe, or I don't remember the years, but in the bubble being so open that you allowed someone to come in and sit yeah. in on partner meetings and write a book about you and chronicle the ups, ups of eBay and the downs of Webvan yep. to then a couple years later, you would, I mean, I couldn't have paid money for a partner at Benchmark to speak to me on the record. I mean, you guys got so aggressively media shy in the other direction. So we have a saying that uh, good judgment comes from experience, which comes from bad judgment. Um, <laughs> and so uh, I think, you know, one of the lessons we learned, which is that, you know, and, and everyone's learned this, but if, if you get too much PR, the, the, the other side of that can be pretty brutal. Mm -hmm. And... And I, I think it's normal. I don't blame anybody. It's just the way it was. So yeah. the combination of just the notoriety we had gotten and the book, when things started going bad, there were a few special journalists who decided to come <laughs> in heavy, like really heavy. Um, and as a result, I think we ended up clamming up for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, plus, there was a lot of work to do. I mean, it was, it was not a pretty time, as we'd already discussed. The book was interesting. Uh, my partner, Bruce, had read this book about deck. Someone maybe remember the name. It's, it's a really old book, but it's a famous book. And it, it was written in a very 
like academic way about here's how this company worked. Mm -hmm. The rise of the new machine, I think it was mm. called. Soul of the new yeah. machine, yeah. And Randall had convinced Bruce that this book was going to take on that tone. It did not. No, it did not. <laughs> and uh, Randall... The book, for those who don't know, it was called E-Boys. Yeah. Like, to give you an idea. And Randall got really um, infatuated with Dave Byrne, who was this huge, bigger-than-life celebrity in our firm. And he got very excited about Webvan. And he, he just he got sucked into writing more of a Hollywood kind of gossip story. And if you read the book, this is also a great funny story. So if you read the book, it has a remarkable amount of profanity in it. And the first draft had three times as much. <laughs> and so I, anytime anybody had used profanity, Randall had obviously written it down. And <laughs> shortly after the book came out, these two founders came in who were like in their tw young, young guys in their 20s. I don't remember their name or the company. But they decided that that's what we liked. So <laughs> they proceeded <laughs> to curse through the entire presentation. Like, not just a little bit, a lot. <laughs> and it took us forever to figure out what had happened. Um, anyway, so yes. So, so I think we shied off a bit. But, you know, o over the years, we've you know, done some experimenting and kind of found our way, and we always end up finding our way back to our core model of this equal partnership. In, mm -hmm. the, in, in late 99, we started expanding geographically because we got excited about Europe as a place for entrepreneurs and, we, and Israel as a place for entrepreneurs. And what we found was that what we really love is what we call the art of company building and working one-on-one -on -one directly with an entrepreneur to help build the senior management team, to help them think about follow-on financing, to help get biz dev deals done. And that as we expanded geographically, we all of a sudden had management responsibilities. Like mm -hmm. they had our brand over there and are they doing what we want them to do? Um, and, and then I really messed up this thing. Uh, we, we were meeting with this company called Skype you may have heard of. And, <laughs> and it was right when we were starting. And so I tried to hand Nicholas off to this person he didn't know, mm. which he later told Meg was a really big mistake on my part. Um, but I, we were trying to do the right thing and help. And so yeah. um, about 06 or 07, we decided that, you know, we really love this artist and craft of company building. We're spending all our Mondays talking about um, whether our brand is being used right internationally or not. And, and they were doing some like convertible debt and we don't like doing that. And, and we messed up this deal. And anyway, we decided to let them move on their own way. And they're called Balderton now. And they've had a lot of IPOs. They've been very successful. Um, and recently, Michael Eisenberg's launched a new fund called Aleph. Um, which is kind of putting an end to that, and we uh, from Israel. One. Yeah, yeah, and we've uh, and we've and, and he he did some incredible work in our in our second Israel fund, and I'm very appreciative of it. But we went back to our knitting that really started, like I said, back in '06. But um, I think it does separate how we think about the game from other people. Yeah, and the notion of expanding scope is not something that we find particularly attractive. You know, if you read any, you know first level business book like Michael Porter's Competitive Strategy, they'll say, look, service businesses are tough to scale. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of reasons why service businesses are tough to scale. And I think we've decided, yes, they're tough to scale and we're not gonna try and scale them. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna try and be the best we can possibly be and focus on doing what we love to do the most. And so you guys have never been tempted by China, India? Mm. Especially after what we went through. Um, and of course, China is a whole different ball of wax. There's a great book, if you've ever read it, called Mr. China. Have you ever read this book? I haven't. It's about a British gentleman who went to China in 96 with a $400 million PE fund to privatize um, businesses in China, and I think returned zero dollars on the fund, and wrote about it in a very charming and, uh, and humorous way. And it just gives you a sense of how tough it is. Mm -hmm. And what ends up happening, and what I've seen with some of the other venture firms that have moved to China, by the way, this is no reflection on the opportunity. In fact, if we want to, I can tell you about my trip in 06, where I met Pony Ma and, and uh, Robin Lee and all these guys, and Lei Jun, and they were incredible entrepreneurs. I think it's a huge opportunity, but 
you know, what happens is these people take the brand over there, they get these people, they teach them to be good venture capitalists, and then they leave and, and get their own brand and their own economics, yeah. which is what I would expect to happen. And I would expect the local VCs to be the best. Like mm -hmm. if I were an LP, that's where I would give them money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then you guys have also been really disciplined in terms of stage. Yes. You haven't launched a seed fund when everyone else was launching a seed fund. You didn't do a growth fund when everyone else was doing a growth fund. Right. And, and, and I'll, so I say a couple things about that. One, the temptation to grow the number of funds you have is high because fee income goes up dramatically. In mm -hmm. fact, and by the way, there should be zero sympathy line for any venture capitalist, so I don't say this. But when, when we cut back, we actually, you know, reduced the economics by not participating in these other funds. But um, we were, at the time, I think, when everybody decided to start expanding into stage, we, we had the benefit of having lived through what we did. So I don't, I, you know, I don't want to pretend like we, we're some kind of deep insight. But there's conflict in being in multiple stages at the same time. So if you're, if you're in the seed business and you're, you've got 100 or 200 seed investments and you're only funding 20 Series A investments, you're telling a lot of people no that you had already told yes to. And when these companies come around uh, to try and raise money mm -hmm. and there's a venture firm that does A's and B's who's in their seed, the first question you ask is, what are they doing? Right. And if your answer isn't, I've already got a term sheet from them, then everyone assumes that they've said no, and now that's going to hurt your fundraise, not help your fundraise. Now, now, there's a lot of VCs who are in the seed stage and do series A's and B's that say that's totally not true, that VCs say that because they don't want to tell the truth, they want to let these guys down gently. I mean, how much of a problem do you really think it is? So I'm going to qualify my own comments and every other comment you've heard from a VC by telling you that I think every time a VC opens <laughs> their mouth, they're speaking to the entrepreneur they haven't met yet. Regardless of who they're talking to or what the topic is, that's their biggest concern is that they're going to miss the next Google. And so they're constantly, constantly marketing to the entrepreneur they haven't met. So mm -hmm. everything you hear, I think, including what I'm going to tell you, has that in mind. <laughs> um, so Has that always been the case or is it worse now? It may be worse now just because transparency is so high. And, well, and, and like, like people are blogging, so there's high. Twitter, oh, yeah, everyone yeah. Has, feels like they have to be a personality. Ab absolutely. Yeah, it's really high right now, the level. And it doesn't, based on how we got here, I don't see any chance of that reversing. It's not going to become more closed. I don't see that happening. How do you guys, I mean, I, I want to get back to that, but this is interesting. How do you guys think about brand as a venture firm? Because I know there's a lot of venture firms, I'd put you guys in this category, I'd put Sequoia in this category, and even Excel to a degree, who for a long time were like, we just don't want to talk to the press. We just don't want it to be about us. We just don't. And it's like, they're all trying to get in the press. And everyone's like, do you think And everybody wants to say that they don't really do you, care about yeah, the press. Yeah, and it's like, they, yeah. they're all hiring the marketing partner. They're all, you know, they're, they're trying to do what Andreessen Horowitz has done, to be honest about it. Well, I don't know. I mean, that kind of thing's gone on for a while. You'll hear all these stories about where, like, Fortune was doing a Kleiner article, and John insisted that all his CEOs be there for the picture. He wouldn't take one by himself. <laughs> like, I mean, people, they're smart, like smart marketing, right? And to, yeah. my, to my earlier point. Um, so, I, I don't know. I think it's always been around. I think for us, having lived through what you already described in 99, like seeking the press at that level, we would view as very dangerous. Um, but the other thing is, you, it's difficult if the game is to get in front of the right entrepreneurs, it's difficult if you're not getting the association with the winners that you have. And we went through a period three years ago which I saw you ask John about, which he demurred on a little bit, um, <laughs> where people were adding logos to their, to their yeah. press releases. They were buying shares in secondary markets and then saying, oh, we've been in this you know, forever. And I think it worked, actually. I think people got confused. They didn't know enough. They didn't care. Mm -hmm. And all the association was drawn. Did, was there any pressure within your partnership to do that? I think there was pressure to say, look, we got to make sure that people understand the work we've done. Mm -hmm. And I, we don't want credit beyond that, but we got to make sure that people understand the work we've done. And maybe, you know, maybe the environment caused that. You know? mm -hmm. so, so you explained a little bit why you didn't want to go into seed funds because of this conflict. Yeah, by the way, and it's not just that conflict. Mm -hmm. You have the conflict where if the next great company in that sector comes along and they're better than the first one and you're in the seed, you might not get the phone call. 
Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a far, far greater economic risk than owning one and a half percent of a company, mm -hmm. like missing one of the big outcomes. Mm -hmm. And so that's, and then there's more. <laughs> um, if you, like us, want our brand to stand for this company building art that we love to do, um, having passive investments is having your brand walk around without the work that you want to be known for. Yeah. And we only have so much time. Part of why it's unscalable. We can only sit on so many boards. And we don't want to be involved and not involved. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not how we want to do things. There's a so lot, a lot of, of reasons not to do the seed side. Right. I think one of the reasons a lot of firms have stepped over those objections to start doing it is they feel like either it's an issue of deal flow. Um, you know, no, we had uh, Naval um, last November, and he you know talked about his theory that he just doesn't think proprietary deal flow exists anymore in the venture world. And there's also the sense that like I, if one of our guests talked about this, maybe it was John, um, that. You know, really, like Y Combinator is sort of the new Sequoia. I mean, they're doing the first, you know, the, the first round, and it's like VCs are getting in later and later, and this yeah. is an industry that's built on the economics of being the first money in. So, you know, there's this, I feel like every story I've written about the venture industry over the last um, 10 years has had to do with the capital efficiency of creating a company now and yeah. how radically that changed. Yeah. I mean, there is so much that's different about funding a company now versus 10, 15 years ago. Doesn't that mean you have to adjust as a venture firm? So I think the whole industry adjusted. I think part of what created the scenario you're talking about is the consumer internet became a hits business. Mm -hmm. Much, I mean, enterprise software, you fund a repeat entrepreneur, they build a product, they get three customers on it, you listen to the customers, they tell you what feature to do next, and then you hire a bunch of Oracle sales guys and it works. And you all make money. <laughs> and it's systematic. And you can do it over and over again, and you can fund a repeat entrepreneur and it just works. Uh, it's oversimplification. Um, but it is systematic. What we found with the consumer internet is so many of these things are dependent upon getting these tiny nuances right to where something takes off, you know, from a network effect or a social or whatever. And we're also seeing many examples of a repeat entrepreneur snapping up to the plate and whiffing. Yeah. And so that's, oops, that's a different game. And I think the venture industry as a whole, not with by talking to each other, but just all learning individual, went up the stack a little bit in the consumer internet mm -hmm. and said, we're gonna wait and see a little bit of traction and we prefer the risk return even if we pay a little more. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the big wins, you know, whether it's uh, Amazon, Facebook, Google, were all funded by the top, the top tier venture firms that went in those deals. It was post traction by a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, these products had been in market and we're, we're out there competing as opposed to funding two people in a PowerPoint. Right. And I think that created a window for the angel community to come in, along with the, the, the cheap cost of starting something. Right. The thing I would push back on the cheap cost of starting something is with engineer salaries going up and up and up, the cost of scaling out a business has never been higher. And so yeah. if, if you want to get to 50 or 100 employees, unless you've discovered uh, the next Google AdWords, um, you're probably going to need some capital to get there. Mm -hmm. um, and that doesn't mean that um, that that should be the path for everyone. And one of the things I try and drive home to every entrepreneur I meet, that choosing venture capital may not be the best way for you to get rich. Mm -hmm. And the number one type of acquisition that, that the corp dev departments at all the large companies like to do is a feature tuck-in. And they'll pay anywhere from 20 to 75 million, and it's their favorite type of deal. Mm -hmm. And once a venture firm gets involved, there's usually one round and another round and a third round and a bunch of options for new employees. And, and the exit equivalent you need to get the same amount of money is drastically different. And so I, you know, make sure you have an idea that's worthy of that big a bet because you, you, you may make a lot more money by steering clear of venture uh, and owning a lot of a company you sell for less money. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely we've seen, I think in this generation, there's a lot of sub hundred million dollar exits. And then there's some truly huge things that took tons of money and a ton of time. Yeah. But there really hasn't been a lot in between. 
where you, you know, you did see that with the heyday of enterprise software yeah. or other industries. Yeah. Look, capital is so wildly available today. One of the stats that's coming out of uh, at least first quarter IPOs, the average company had raised $104 million prior to filing. Mm -hmm. which is relatively new. By the way, let me, before I finish, uh, I want to go back to the angel thing. So even in the angel world, they have their own rhetoric for the entrepreneurs. And mm -hmm. one of the things, they, they, first of all, they love to create the notion that you should always stop at seed before A, even though historically that hasn't been true. And you can certainly talk to a venture capitalist without a seed investment. Mm -hmm. um, but they like to create that that's the, the way it should be. And mm -hmm. They're playing their narrative, and I completely understand why they would do that. Um, but it's not true. I mean, plenty of companies' first investment is from a venture firm. What we've seen recently is that someone may have taken one and then two angel rounds, and they've given away 40% of their company. So the angel rounds are more expensive than the venture rounds. You could have gotten three to $5 million for 23% of your company or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even though he would never admit it, Paul Graham's deal, 75K for 7%, is that is, that's like, what is the post money on that? It's like 2.5 or something? It's down and dirty. Right. Um, but he, you know, don't, he wouldn't talk about it that way because there's value-added services or something. <laughs> which, um, so anyway, everyone's got their story. We've got ours. I totally appreciate what everyone's doing, but, but keep that in mind in, in the back of your head. Do you think that the angel stuff has been in a frenzy? A little bit. It, it certainly, there was a period four years ago where all anyone wanted to talk about was the super angels and the end of venture capital. Mm -hmm. And I mean, like, and, and the Amazon Web Services and it's cheaper to build and no one will ever need to see a VC again. And that has not played out as true. Yeah, not at all. And there are a number of, of people that are firms that were kind of born at that time that are here to stay and have done incredibly well. Floodgate, Mike Maples, first round, um, you know, there's just there's a ton that have done a really good job and you know Ron Conway and they're going to be here forever and but there were a lot that started that aren't and this whole are you going to name them no 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 but <laughs> to the are you the are you the one that gets the the naming rights to series A crunch or is that somebody else I, I will take it I'm okay. not sure I came up so, with it so <laughs> so I think what happened was there was just so if you look at the data the amount of dollars that went out as series A and series B wasn't changing Mm -hmm. But the number of inputs of people that exactly. wanted them because there had been all this angel overfunding was dramatically high. Mm -hmm. And so they made it sound like a crunch. The, the irony from my perspective was these are the same people that saying they didn't need to venture firms because <laughs> they were, you know, dinosaurs and were going to go away. And now they're turning around and saying, well, you guys aren't funding enough stuff. I said, OK, well, <laughs> anyway, um, I do think there is there is something going on down at that level in the narrative that may not be healthy. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a counterculture argument that, you know, kind of screw the establishment, we're going to do things our way. And is, oh, while I was on vacation a few weeks ago, I read this book. It, any, any basketball fans in the room? This may, okay, none. So. Whole four or five. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there's a book called Playing Their Hearts Out that's about AAU basketball. And for those of you who don't know, in North America, your high school coaches aren't allowed to coach all year round, even though you can in Europe. This is why we're losing in the, in the Olympics. But um, <laughs> what happens in that time where you're not with your coaches, this whole league and world has come up called AAU. And it's, it's, there's a lot that's good, I guess, but there's a lot that's unhealthy. And mm -hmm. Nike and Reebok have gotten involved, and there's money flowing around. And these are, you know, with kids that are 12 or 14. And I thought about that when I thought about some of the things that happens in our world, you know, and, and what you'll inherently, the good coaches will say, hey, you, like, glorify slam dunks over team defense and, like, just things that aren't, you know, what you'd make part of a long-term winning program. And... You know, when I see things like people bragging about getting an uncapped convert, like, I, to me, it feels a little bit like the slam dunk. Like, there's, mm -hmm. there's no correlation between getting an uncapped convert and building companies that are large and here to stay. Mm -hmm. There's absolutely no data that would suggest that's true. But they celebrate this kind of counterculture win. I, right. I, I met a startup once. It's once. kind of the cult of the founder thing. Right. It's like the founder can do no wrong, whatever the founder wants, anything pro-founder, sometimes to the expense of the team. Yeah, I met a founder once who was convinced if he bought Max and let dogs in the office that he was going to be successful. 
And, <laughs> and I think he was serious. Was he wearing like, a hoodie? <laughs> I don't know if he had a hoodie on or not. He probably did. Um, but you got to be careful, right? I mean, the, the things that lead to long-term success are having a good strategy, yeah. you know, working extremely hard, being ridiculously ambitious, hiring an incredible team, uh, having a great culture. You know, it's not having an uncapped convert. And well, so at times I worry that that community mm -hmm. is celebrating the wrong things. Well, I feel like, you know, it's a lot of times people extrapolate from the wrong things. And I think this is part of the problem with the celebrity culture around particularly consumer web entrepreneurship. I mean, I was um, at a, a party at Ron Conway's house. Um, this was when I was still at TechCrunch. And it was right after, I think, the Crunchies or something. And there was an entrepreneur, who I won't name, who had started this company that raised a ton of money. And he was literally, he was not only doing the, a great impression of Mark Zuckerberg, but it was an impression of Mark Zuckerberg from the movie, not even the real guy. Right. And he just kept repeating like lines from the movie and things that like people had heard that he, that he would have said. And it was like, you know, not surprisingly, like that company is no longer in business. And yeah, and you can, it's easy to get caught up in mm -hmm. success, right? One of the things that I saw firsthand by having this opportunity to be at this Division I uh, basketball program was, you know, these guys would come in at his 18-year-olds and on this college campus and be told they were heroes and gods, and it does amazingly weird things to your brain. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't even think that it's like a not like I don't think it's something you blame someone for. I think the human is designed in such a way where they're susceptible to that. Yeah. And and it creates this sense of entitlement where you you are really set up for a fall because you don't have you don't have it in touch with reality. If, if any of you get a chance, there's this great series on ESPN called 30 for 30, but there's one called Broke, mm -hmm. where they go in and study these pro athletes, and like 80% of pro athletes are broke within six years of being out of the league. And I think some entrepreneurs that hit it big quick should watch that show, <laughs> um, because there's a lot of lessons to be learned. Well, it's like the whole, um, you know, we were just talking about when Larry Ellison spoke at, at the D conference a couple years ago, and I remember he talked about how, you know, how surreal it was for him after Steve Jobs passed away, and obviously they were very good friends, and he was reading about people, he read about some guy who was saying, you know, he dressed like Steve Jobs every day because he wanted to be like Steve Jobs, and Larry was like, you've utterly missed the point. Right, the exactly. reason he dressed like that every day was because he didn't want to think about what he was wearing, and you're actually thinking about it to a ridiculous degree. Like, you're totally extrapolating agree. from completely the wrong right, right, right. metric. And I think that happens. I think that's a lot of what you see. Yeah, yeah. Do you think it's a downside of the, the cult of the super young, inexperienced entrepreneur? Because that is another talking point every VC says. I don't know if it ties yep. into your marketing thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. We talked about this, but every, every venture firm says, we love to back the founder that goes all the way. And I will tell you, if you ever meet a venture capitalist who that's not true for, they're not going to be a venture capitalist very long. Because <laughs> CEO searches are 50-50 at best. So you'd be cutting your probable return. Like, no one wants to back a founder that has to be replaced. No one. But if you say it, and get and get associated with it. I think it's a good marketing technique. So, so I'm saying it too. I love to back founders that go all the way. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, one of the trends I've seen recently. So, first of all, I, I actually wrote a blog post about why I think youth is so incredibly important and valuable. And we have in our in our world right now. Uh, we're at a time where it feels like the rules of the game are changing faster than they were five years ago or ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And so. If you, you know, were a marketing person four years ago, there's almost zero relevance to that, to being one today. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't teach yourself to constantly learn the new stuff, then your value decays very quickly. Um, on top of that, you know, a young person just brings this incredible naivete about the previous rules, which actually can be really helpful. Um, but what I think is important is they have to know where they have an advantage and know where they don't have an advantage and focus their time where they do and surround themselves with expertise where they don't. Right. And that's a hard thing for someone to get their mind around mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of young founders want to like rewrite their own ERP system. I, <laughs> I had heard that that topic came up at Google at one time, you know, like, well, we don't like SAP, so we can do it better. But, but you're not going to make yourself better by doing that. Yeah, like, it's a matter so, of focus. It's yeah, where, where are you going to be adding to your competitive advantage? But 
Um, we look, the Valley sees it over and over and over and over again. We just were lucky enough to back Evan Spiegel at Snapchat, who's all of 21 years old. And, mm -hmm. you know, it, young people continue to make it happen in this world. So speaking of Snapchat, because I was getting to that, you, in, in a lot of conversations you and I have had, you've been very aggressive at other venture firms who seemingly pay any price to get in a deal. You guys allegedly play, paid a ridiculously right? high price to get into Snapchat. Well, based on the delta between the current recent round and the one we paid for, I would disagree. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's interesting. I was on a panel yesterday with uh, um, Philip LaFont, who's one of the uh, best-known hedge fund managers, and someone was asking him what he looked for in a deal as, on the public side. And he said they've come to realize that in the consumer internet, some of these things, you know, go this far and then they just keep going and going and going. Mm -hmm. And that he, you know, had learned to adjust valuation relative to seeing that trend over and over again. And he was answering a question like, what are you looking for? What are you most excited about? And that was his answer. And so, I, you know, I, I don't think it's irrational. It's, we're in a business of looking for what I like to call positive black swans. And mm -hmm. if you think you see one, you know, any price is kind of any price. So you guys would have paid any price? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I look, it, um, I think, you know, when KP went into Amazon, which was like 96, they paid like 70 pre, which seemed ungodly. And the Google round, because I was there, mm -hmm. you know, it went down at like 80 or 90 pre, no revenue, and it seemed crazy. Yeah. You know, Facebook at 500 million. Yeah, we David just C keep got seeing, in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And we just keep seeing that over and over again. And as many of the VCs you've interviewed have said, you know, the thing about our business is you can only lose one times your money. And the real losses are the missed outcomes because you right. miss, you know, un, you know, ungodly amounts of money by, mm -hmm. by failing. So you have to teach yourself. Um, to be more optimistic than maybe you were programmed to yourself because there's way more cost um, to a false negative. Right, so what is so special about Snapchat for people who don't get it? So, for the people who still think it's just about sexting. Yeah, so I'll, what, what, what we came to, to believe, not only from looking at the incredible numbers which continue to be just remarkable but from, and spending time with the team, but from talking to um, their community of users, some of which included our partner's um, children, um, the, I heard it best expressed this way. Young people have come to look at Facebook the way older people look at LinkedIn. In other words, it's virtually public. Mm -hmm. Like all of their parents are there, all of their friends' moms are there, all their teachers are there. And if anything goes up, then it's permanent. Mm -hmm. And so that's not fun for them. That's mm -hmm. not communication. That's like, you know, the... Uh, putting a magnet on the front of the refrigerator or something like that, mm -hmm. um, where everyone's going to see it. And that this was a new, a new way for them to share experiences that didn't have that anxiety with it. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and that's what Evan talks about, and we came to believe that's exactly what's going on. Mm -hmm. And I should say, I don't think we've announced this yet, but we actually are having Evan at a Panda Monthly in L.A., our next that's one. That's great. Yeah, which I'm he's, super he's excited brilliant. about. He's really, really, really cool. Yeah, yeah. And I called it. him and I was doing this like hard sell on getting him to do it. And he was like, oh, I've actually been attending the LA ones. I've always like wanted to do one. And I was like, really? So that's, I love young entrepreneurs. That's part of, <laughs> of what I love about the Valley, which is there's so many people trying to learn. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people that are really willing to help. Yeah. And all you got to do is ask. And so one of the things I try and encourage my companies to do is have every you know, employee, VPs, you know, directors, find peers at company, like companies that aren't competitors mm -hmm. and just hang out with them. Yeah. Because the things you're going to learn are remarkable. And almost like 80% of the time, if you call someone and say, man, I really respect you and what you're doing. Can I get 30 minutes for coffee? It's yes. That's what I've always been amazed about in the Valley. And I've yeah. always said the same thing to people moving here and, and the reporters, you know, who work for me. Because, I mean, I'm amazed how often, you know, even as a reporter, I'll call people and, like, really powerful people will make time for you. And I think it's because you can get from a nobody to a somebody so quickly here that everyone kind of remembers their being... <laughs> covering their ass. Yeah, no one wants to be the guy who snubs Mark Zuckerberg. Exactly. But I think it's also the... People kind of remember when they were that nobody. They do. 
And you heard my story. I mean, a lot of people helped me up along the way. So, right. yeah. yeah, it's a great opportunity that a lot of people don't take advantage of. All right, there's a couple of things I want to ask you about okay. and sort of like let's run through this, you know, kind of quickly so we can get to questions from the audience. Um, so, you know, we were – well, first of all, let's get to the IPO market because that's one thing I want to spend a okay. little bit of time on because I think it's, I think it's really interesting. I mean, you know, it's become very fashionable to just trash the IPO market, yep. Yep. and there's a ton of um, investors like, and there's entre entrepreneurs like Phil Libin, who actually I think we have um, in September for Pando Monthly, you know, who's talked about how much they disdain IPOs and they don't want to go public, and it's, right it's so corner. it's so horrible, yep. and yet, yep. and yet, like everyone knows, yep. they're kind of preparing for this. So this is a topic I'm super passionate about. But like I, you are I, one of the only guys who's like, there is no issue with IPOs. Well, There's actually, no issue with the market. Door, Everyone's wrong. Dor was on stage two days ago saying the same thing, and he said the Jobs Act's been a huge positive boon, and it has. It's been incredible what that's done. Um, not to mention they added a materiality clause to Sarbox that made it a lot less intrusive. So a lot of positive stuff has happened. But back to the question. So if you came to the Valley in the 90s, and all the action then was down on, on University Avenue and not here, but if you went down there and stopped an executive and said, what's your long-term goal? And they would say, I want to take a company public. I want to ring the bell at the yeah. NASDAQ. And, and I equate it to, like, getting drafted in the NBA. Like, they just, mm -hmm. you know, that was the badge of honor that mean you had made it. And it was, it, it had that kind of idyllic notion at the time. Mm -hmm. And we've come a long way from that. Um, sometime, and I don't know if, you know, the type of people I might point to would be Larry Page, who I don't think really wanted to go public. But then Mark Zuckerberg made it very clear he didn't want to go public. And mm -hmm. you started to get this. Reed Hoffman, too, by yeah, the way. Yeah, you started to get this narrative that the entrepreneur community really jumped on that it's bad and that you don't want to do it. And um, I've always, you know, first of all, I, I, I think that if you look at some of the best outcomes where people have run the ball the farthest, um, it's just nothing's further from their mind. They're just not thinking about it. And some of the recent people I'd point to is Jeff Bezos, Reed Hastings, Mark Benioff. Mm -hmm. They just felt it was a part of the step along the way. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it was just a new constituency they could invite into their lives to use to their advantage because they know how to do it better than the competition. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, all three of those entrepreneurs to me are just incredible people who have done amazing things. And this notion that you're kind of afraid of it, I always felt was a little weird. And I'll, I'll use an example that, that some people may find offensive. But if, you know, if, if Andrew Luck was coming out of Stanford, you know, he was the expected first round draft forever. And they were about to do the NFL draft and he held a press conference and he said, you know, I just don't think I'm gonna sign up for it. He goes, you know, the, 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 they, they track your metrics every game. Like, like every single throw, someone <laughs> writes it down. And they video every single thing. And then they have these shows, 24-hour sports shows, where they just talk about your mechanics and everything. How could I possibly become a better player with that amount of scrutiny? Now, if someone did that, they would be laughed out of the sports stadium. <laughs> um, and, and, and as an alternative, maybe the Reed equivalent or the, or the Benioff equivalent, you look at RG3 and he's like, I'm so ready to show up and play for this Washington Redskins team. I'm going to kill it. I'm going to deliver everything I possibly can. My teammates are going to love that I'm here. Now, if you're a buy side investor that puts money into IPOs, which one of those two guys are you going to back? It's not even a hard question. Mm -hmm. Right, you you would back the guy who showed up and ready to play the game, mm -hmm. and so I'd be careful if I were Phil, you know, running around telling people you, you you don't like the notion of being out there because there are plenty of guys, including people I've worked with like Spencer Raskoff at Zillow or Jeremy Stoppelman mm -hmm. at Yelp who've just done a remarkable job mm -hmm. uh, in the past two or three years and never once complaining about the game that's on the field. Right. And to a certain extent, look, whether you like it or not. We all, including the journalists, use market cap as the scorecard. Yep. And if that's the game, that's the game. And, and it, being public is kind of the next level up. And it allows you to do M&A. It allows you to control the bully pulpit in terms of talking about how the business should be measured or thought about. Um, and the great ones are great at that, at mm -hmm. that latter part. You mentioned Yelp. 
Um, and you were also on the board of Open Table, and mm -hmm. you know, Foursquare is you know also sort of getting more into recommendations and a lot of the games of those two. At least you know how I use all of them on my yeah, yeah, phone yeah. to discover what's around me. How do you see that whole local restaurant-heavy space shaking out? And do you see Yelp continuing to get bigger? Are they in early innings, or is Yelp kind of done what Yelp's going to do? Well, we're, we're still an investor in the company, so I'll probably be on narrative, uh, even though <laughs> you know I do believe what I'm about to tell you. Um, so if you look at where Yelp well, is, presumably you'd have sold your shares. Yeah, if exactly. You didn't. <laughs> if you look at if you look at like business penetration in Yellow Page companies, only five or six years ago, and you look at Yelp penetration from an advertising standpoint, it's like a fraction mm -hmm. of what's possible. And so I think the brand and what they do offers an opportunity that's much bigger than where they are today. And TripAdvisor, which is focused in a narrower TAM than they are, has a seven or nine, some crazy billion dollar market cap right now. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think it's early. I mean, you're starting to see some of the bigger companies get excited about local, including, I guess, Facebook yesterday had a lot of results that related to that. Yeah. And that's everyone getting after the billions of dollars that have evaporated from the Yellow Page market. So yeah. it still feels early, but look, we're starting to, I call it painting the white space, we're starting to put these computers and things deep into every little you know industry that's out there. Yeah. And then we have to connect it all up. And then we figure out whether it connects into Facebook or Google or Yelp mm -hmm. or Foursquare or whatever. And uh, it's, we're, it's very early days of figuring out how that's going to play out. And speaking of computers going into areas we may not have ever thought, you're also an investor in Uber. Um, you know, I never would have thought that you know, cabs would be utterly reshaped yeah. um, by the web. Um, Uber, we've, we are incredibly emotional about as a blog. Um, I was wondering what word you <laughs> we, we both, yeah, some of us, including me, use it quite a bit and think it's a phenomenal tool. Yeah. Um, most of us think uh, the founder himself is a phenomenal tool as well. So um, <laughs> um, apparently after ve vehemently denying he would be doing such a thing as raising capital, he has yeah. now admitted they're raising capital. And yeah. supposedly someone reported this week at a $3 billion valuation. I mean, the thing, the question I have about Uber is, um, look, this is, Travis wants to basically control the ball on every court. I mean, he's playing basketball over here, and then he sees someone playing basketball and runs over to play over there and then over there. I mean, they're looking about getting into things, you know, transporting things that aren't human beings. There's, you know, potential of Uber choppers. There's high end. They're aggressively going after low end to yeah. go after Lyft. I mean. Focus is an incredibly important thing as an entrepreneur. Yeah. Do you worry that Uber, which... How many questions a, are you leading up I'm get, to? I'm getting up to it here. <laughs> Uber has done one thing extraordinarily yeah. well. We can all admit that. Yeah. But are they trying to now extrapolate that out to way too many things okay. and getting defocused? So a, a couple things I would tell you. So one, um, I feel very lucky to be involved with the company. One of the reasons I was ready and prone to do it, I had, having done Open Table, had been, you know, met with a lot of different verticals because people would come and say, well, we're going to do this for this and this. And I had spent some time with the companies that were doing uh, taxi automation. And there's a lot of reasons why a mar trying to start a marketplace against that is not ideal because prices are fixed. Mm -hmm. There's an oligopoly in most cities, which mm -hmm. makes it tough to get started. You can't control quality mm -hmm. because of regulation. And so I had already come to the conclusion, like the first person that walks in here that's got black car as their base instead of taxi, I'm going to get super excited because the fragmentation and waste is going to create an opportunity that's, that's really big. I had no idea that it would be this big either. Um, uh -huh. And one of the things that's happened, and I think this is true of Airbnb and a few others, is the software creates such high utilization that the drivers are making way more money than they ever made before. and the users are getting a phenomenal experience. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like found money. Yeah. And any time you have that, that's what eBay had, you end up with these just huge things that take off because economics drive behavior. Mm -hmm. And so you're changing economics by keeping the cars more active. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, you know, but it, like I said, it's been way bigger than I expected. I think they're not only um, changing the industry, but I think they're actually changing the way people live. 
And so Friday and Saturday nights are just monsters. And I hear anecdotally from friends in L.A. or San Francisco, they're going out more. They're intentionally not drinking and driving. You know, they're using this as a way to change their lifestyle. And mm -hmm. we're seeing during the week people that are daily users who have replaced a second car. And instead of paying for the garage, you know, in, in the hills and, and the garage down on California Street, they just use this mm -hmm. and don't have to worry about those things. And so... Um, I think Travis has said this publicly, so I'll say it. Like, when we started, there were 700 black cars in all of San Francisco, and now there's, like, over 1,000 on Uber. Mm -hmm. Like, so, you know, it's not even, like, the market's just blowing up. Um, to your focus question. So I think, you know, if you look at what he got right, it was a number of amazing little things. So he had a vision that the app should disappear as much as you possibly can. And just kind of one button, my partner Matt calls the, I, the uh, smartphone the remote control for your life. And that only works mm -hmm. if it's very simple mm -hmm. and it goes away. And little things like embedding the tip so that the user didn't have to sit there and think, oh, should I tip? Because that creates anxiety. People don't like anxiety. Yeah. If you can remove anxiety, it makes them happy. Mm -hmm. And so by having all that in, and then it was a, you know, it was a beautiful app. V2 is much more beautiful than V1, but V2 is incredible. Um, so they built in it, and knowing that the design centricity, getting the drivers, getting the product right, he was remarkably dedicated to customer service early on. Mm -hmm. His two cultural tenets was give riders high fives and drivers hugs, and very much focused on them both having very high satisfaction levels with the service. So much so that in the early days, if someone had a problem, he would cold call them mm -hmm. and tell them, and this is a great lesson for any entrepreneur trying to kickstart a flywheel, he would say, you had a bad experience. That's not what we're trying to do. Here's what we're trying to do. I'm going to put a credit on your account. If you ever need anything, give me a call. Mm -hmm. And if you take someone who's going to become a negative, whatever NPS person, and make them positive, like the math is incredible. Right. And so that's a really important thing to do. Um, and so he just he got so many things right. PR. He's been extremely effective at, at the regulatory world, which I'm sure we could talk about forever. But it's <laughs> there's no reason to expect anybody in Silicon Valley to be good at that. Yeah. And, and he's just used social media in such a way that it's it's probably like no one's ever done it before at that level. So mm -hmm. um, so I've just been really impressed and, and continue to be impressed. He, in addition to what everyone sees externally, he's remarkably focused on operating controls, um, continuous improvement internally, the playbooks that we have for launching new cities are just amazing and the metrics all get better. Um, in terms of your core question about focus, um, it's a, I totally agree with that notion and I would argue that, you know, based on the things I've seen, um, he's been remarkably focused. He's also remarkably audacious and ambitious mm -hmm. and wants to do big, great things. And I think VCs have this kind of like dichotomy, they, they think they want someone who focuses, but then the ones that really knock it out of the park, like the Bezoses of the world, are constantly tinkering and expanding what they do. I would even say Benioff, you know, relative to other enterprise software people, is not set still. When new things yeah. pop up, Twitter pops up, whatever, he jumps in front of it and adds it to the portfolio. Uh -huh. And so I'm actually, you know, th thrilled to see him thinking in a very broad way because I think it heightens the likelihood we could get to a very big outcome. Um, he's built a platform in such a way that some of those things that look unfocusing don't take very much time or effort. The ice cream thing is very easy to turn on and off mm -hmm. and creates a lot of PR and a lot of positive affection for the brand. Mm -hmm. um, and he encourages his GMs to think experimentally mm -hmm. in the, for each city which is another interesting thing because you get, you then get, just as I had talked about you know, VP of marketing, she talked to four others, they have, you know, whatever, 30 people trying different things, some of which may not work, some of which may not. Mm -hmm. But that's valuable, right? Mm -hmm. um, that kind of experimentation is valuable if it's inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And they're the not, by the way, they're not uh, spending money on marketing. They built a product experience that people love so much that the thing just goes. The thing that I think is actually genius about Uber's model is the fact that riders are also rated by the drivers. Yeah. It has made me so polite when I get in a car and so prompt because I'm obsessed amazing. with it. And yeah. it's like, I feel like there's such a love fest between me and that driver with both of us trying to make yeah. sure each other are yeah. highly rated. So I'll get picked up quickly again. And, and I think about this. 
the alternative, the previous forms of public transportation or taxis, think about the civility of that relationship that you've had in your life. Well, they've gotten a lot more civil. But the, but the contrast <laughs> is massive, and I think that's part of what's happening here. And, and on that point, you know, we've heard a lot of from a, a lot of different types of communities, like the female community, that, that they feel safer because everyone knows everyone. You know you're in this car with this driver. That driver's been raided. Mm -hmm. Like there's way more knowledge than traveling around without it. We, I've even heard down on the peninsula that parents are putting the app on their kids' phones and teenagers and saying, look, if you get stuck God, somewhere. People have too much money on the peninsula. Uh, honestly. This, look, uh, if you were like, Uber X that's rides, like the people take cheap, their people to relative, like sushi after a softball come game on, instead come on, of hot dogs. Come on. The point being the... Um, <laughs> That, that they say, look, if you get in a situation mm -hmm. where someone's been drinking or you don't want to ride with them right. or whatever, you know, jump in. Take Uber. a three hundred dollar yeah. Uber it's, ride. Come on, you know, you know that's not true. <laughs> no, and, I and think to your point awful. about the prices, um, look, one thing about Travis, I'll tell you that for me is just super exciting, which is he loves business. Mm -hmm. He loves products too, but he <laughs> loves business. And I think we've had a few high profile entrepreneurs who love product, but could probably take it without business if they didn't have to. I think that's a fair point. And, 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 and I think that they're not going to get as far as a result. Because look, business strategy is an art. And mm -hmm. there's competition. And you have to go out and win. And you have to think about offense and defense and moats and all these types of things. Yeah. And he's great at it. I he wouldn't, loves I wouldn't, business. Yeah. I wouldn't want to bet against him. <laughs> you I'm didn't. glad I'm not. <laughs> Two of your other companies I want to ask you about before we go to questions. Um, first of all, um, we were talking in the green room before that you think Grubhub Seamless is one of the most underrated companies in your yeah. portfolio. Yeah. Tell us about why. Well, it's really just a matter of size, and I think both, and, and also because the, the, neither company has, I think, really attacked the, the left coast as they should. And so the brand's not really known here. Um, one company was started in Chicago and another New York, so they haven't had the publicity in the Silicon Valley press that one would have. Mm -hmm. um, but the Merge Company is a very large company. Um, it's a category that's massive, um, it, like just the amount of food that's eat. This is takeout and delivery ordered over your phone. Um, and we're really excited about some of the combinations. Seamless is big in New York. Grubhub is big in the Midwest. Um, they have a great iPad product. We have a, a lot of great tools for the back office. We're, we've actually created an app that runs in the restaurant and then an app that the drivers have, and now the restaurant owner can see their drivers mm -hmm. while they're out. And so, anyway, it's, I, you're going to hear a lot more about the company, I think, as the two of them come together. But You it's, love efficiency around people eating. I, I guess Open so. Open table, yeah. 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 Rub -hub. I guess so. Just as quickly I just, as I you love can the get white food. space. I love the white <laughs> space. I, like, I, I don't... Like, if you see people innovating somewhere where they haven't innovated before, one, one of the most... One of the pieces of writing that had the biggest impact on my career as an investor is this guy named Howard Marks, who's a pretty famous investor, um, wrote this article about um, non-consensus accurate predictions. And he said, look, there's four types of predictions you could have. And he drew a quadrants. And he said they could be accurate or non-accurate and consensus or non-consensus. And the, everyone knows that, that inaccurate predictions are valueless, so you can cross those two out. He says, but most people are confused into thinking that an accurate consensus prediction can make money. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to make money if everyone knows it's coming mm -hmm. um, because everyone bets on it simultaneously. And the way business works, the opportunity gets whittled down. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about non-consensus accurate predictions constantly as a venture capitalist. And one of the ways I like to do that is to look at the white space. Like when an entrepreneur comes in talking about automating or putting software somewhere where it hasn't been before and you can sense the advantage, they're going to be competing with nobody mm -hmm. um, versus, you know, trying to go after an incumbent in an already in, in, interesting space. And also, like, the, the, these smartphones and tablets just allow for a type of automation and workflow that's just really cool. Yeah. People like pressing buttons and having stuff happen for them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you mentioned that you were thinking the person who comes in here and tries to do transportation with black cards, I'm going to get excited about. Are there other things like that that you haven't seen that you're thinking in the back of your mind that you would get really excited about? Sure. I'll mention a couple in case an entrepreneur is working on them. <laughs> um, there's a few entrepreneurs working on this space, which I just find really wild. 
and, and other entrepreneurs have already done it, so uh, this one's probably not that big of a, of a secret, but commercial real estate brokers take a percentage of the whole lease. Like you go do a seven year lease and they're like taking a percentage of that whole thing. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. So mm -hmm. I intend to find out why. I've met with 42 floors and a few others. So there, there are people hacking at that. But I think if you created a Zillow or a listing like network for all commercial lease space, I think that would be really valuable. The bigger one, the, 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 the unicorn that I think everyone's looking for, not just me, is the picture perfect interest graph play. Mm -hmm. um, people spend enormous amounts of money on their hobbies that matter to them. And it strikes me that it ought to be easier if I'm mountain biking in Topeka to get connected to the people that are doing that. And right. in every one of these verticals. And you know, people like Pinterest and Quora you know, talk about the interest graph and they're out there trying to get it. But I don't feel like we've had the Google of that space. And maybe it will be one of those, maybe it will. Mm -hmm. But the monetization element, if someone pulls that off, if someone aggregates everybody around every single interest with a geographic overlay also, mm -hmm. ooh, man, that is gonna sing. That is gonna be a really big outcome. <laughs> Twitter. Probably your most high-profile company. Absolutely. Um, you know, for a long time, people saw Twitter as sort of the Facebook. A couple years later, yeah. Um, when you saw the pain that Facebook went through with its IPO, did it make you worry at all? No. I mean, I think they're in very different situations. You know, partially because of the time period, and partially just because they're different companies doing different things. I think the world for a long period of time just called them all social media mm -hmm. and didn't spend the time to figure out how one was different from the other. And the, the one-to-many nature of Twitter and the fact that it's a broadcast network where people go to listen is just very different from the one-to-one -one communication or one-to-few communication that's bi-directional and takes place on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And so I don't view them in that way at all. Of course, they've had their own evolution and path and they've had their own highs and lows, and it wasn't that long ago that the, 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 the crippled bird was on the cover of Fortune. Um, <laughs> but I think Dick and Ollie and Adam have just done a remarkable job. And I don't think there's anyone who, in the press or in the community, that thinks that's not true, right? Yeah. I think it's very obvious that they've had that impact. And when you talk to people in the advertising world, they're super excited about the types of products they're bringing Someone table. just died. Yeah. <laughs> I have to lock the doors. <laughs> anyway, the company's doing great, and um, I'm really excited for them. And, and as a user, I just love it. Like, I wake yeah. up every morning. Like, it's where I get my news and information. It's totally replaced. It is absolutely my first stop for information. Yeah, if I were to be, like, handicapped, or, or if I had to pick, like, one consumer web company started in the last 10 years that, you know, is the only one I could still have and the others would go away. I mean, it would easily, like, pick keeping Twitter and over. The, and, the, and the network effect is so strong because anyone that's built a reputation on there immediately becomes a promoter of the product. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you go to the Warriors game and they're announcing the players with their Twitter handles as they announce the starting lineup. It's wild. And you speak on a news program and they put your Twitter handle up there and that's all reinforcement for the brand. I mean, that's that really powerful. That is one of the things that to me is so different about Twitter and Facebook. I mean, Twitter really got celebrities and Twitter really got all of that, like what, the, you know, what we used to see with AOL keywords, you know, yep. it used to be like, there'd be a movie and it'd be like AOL keyword Batman, you yeah. know? I mean, Twitter got that and Facebook really didn't in the same way. Yeah. You know, I think Instagram was starting to get that. I agree with that. Which is one reason I think the Instagram, yeah. Facebook, Another one of our investments, by the way. <laughs> well, for like a minute. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, it was right before they I think sold. It was like eighteen months. No, no, no. We were, we were. We no. That's not true. That's not true. <laughs> that was a different firm. High profile. Um, firm. No, that was yeah, Greylock and a I couple others. Sequoia and but Greylock did too. I don't know about that. Yeah, it was John Lilly. Oh, did they? Okay, fair enough. You, you know more than me I do. On these no, 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 things, no, 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 no. <laughs> Um, how big, we've now discussed this with three different investors in Twitter, but I'll go ahead and ask okay. you, how big was missing Instagram for Twitter? Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't, as a user, I don't think of it as necessarily um, that big a deal. Like, I didn't see 
personally that that this plus this necessarily equaled something else. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I have a full appreciation for everything that's Instagram. I see it as a as a very easy to use and hyper efficient way to share photos. The one to many aspect, which some people use it for, I don't have that user experience. So I might not be the right person to try and map those things together. Mm -hmm. But if you look at, I mean, another way I would think about that is if you look at where Twitter is today relative to where it was three or four years ago, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't have, I couldn't be more pleased with where we are relative to where we were. Yeah. And was it obvious to you guys at the time, my, my memory's fading on sort of where Benchmark's involvement was with the company when Dick came in, but you predated Dick, yes. if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, that's correct. So was it, a, was it at all obvious how good he was going to be at that job? Because a lot of the investors I talked to at the time, a lot of the people at the time thought, well, you know, we're not even sure this is the guy for it, but we cannot have an interim guy. We can't have someone yeah. from the outside. And this is the guy we can all. put in. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I always heard the comedian element. Like, how could a comedian be a good CEO? Right. I don't, not that, that <laughs> there's any rule about that. Um, <laughs> I don't know, you know, I, it's hard to say at the time, you know, if those things are obvious or not. And I think one of the very diff most difficult parts of this job is trying to predict, especially when you're doing something that high profile about a CEO coming in to some company that high, it's very hard to predict whether it's going to stick or not. Mm -hmm. And we've seen lots of great examples of flame outs at high profile companies. And, um, you know, you, you look for someone who's going to be a cultural fit. You look for someone who has a passion and understanding about the product. Um, and, you, and you look for someone who you think has the leadership instincts. But I, I, it would be impossible for me to answer your question, yes, because mm -hmm. I just don't think you have enough information when you're making those decisions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I want to go to some questions from the audience. I believe there's a microphone right over here. Um, if some folks want to work their way back. I know it's very tight in the crowd. There's people on the move. These people are either running for the exits or they are running for the microphone or both. They're running for the party out in the street. They're running, yes. I was a little <laughs> ominous that after I made the joke about someone dying, it got really quiet. <laughs> All right. Yeah, just the more you talk, they can fix it. Okay. Um, I was curious as to what investment, no, uh, what investment have, you have, have you made in the past where you were most passionate about, but either didn't reach the potential that you thought or flamed out? That's yeah. a great question. Um, I, I, the one that immediately comes to mind is a company we sold recently to a European company called ABB, and is a company called Tropos. And they have a wireless technology that allows you to do citywide Wi-Fi in a mesh layout. And I had always felt, these two founders, Sri and Chari, I felt that they had built just this incredible product. Like, in fact, the, 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 the Google Mountain View network that's still live today and free is all built on Tropos equipment. And it processes about 10x the data of all three of the cellular networks combined. And so just remarkably strong performance of this product. And for a variety of reasons that I won't belabor, um, we never got the sales and marketing and distribution right and ended up going through a lot of CEOs and a lot of money. And, you know, we got some money on the sale, but relative to where my expectations, there was a time where Earthlink was going to roll it out. Gary Betty was the CEO, and we had a $10 million quarter. And I thought, you know, IPO, it's going to be fabulous. And Gary Betty, unfortunately, passed away, and he was our biggest product champion. Wow. And Earthlink backed out. You know, we went from being the cover of the Wall Street Journal, and that's a hard lesson to learn because as a young VC, when something hits 10 million a quarter, you, you bagged it. You're like, oh, this is one of the winners. Mm -hmm. And those can be the most painful, you know, when they don't play out. And I felt really bad for the entrepreneurs because especially the technical ones who I think did their part like, you know, perfectly. And, and we weren't able to get the right, you know, group around them and the right strategy to make it work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so hi, Bill. I'm, I'm an early user and a big fan of Nextdoor and Woodside, and, yeah. and uh, I know that's kind of a white space opportunity, so kind of slow-growing social network for neighborhoods. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, you know, how did you get involved in that? Was that through your, you know, you know, Narav and, and, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, Sarah, that's, that's, a, that's a classic. 
that you'll hear from every venture investor that you know you 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 have these opportunities to work with people over and over again. And so Nerv was one of my very first investments at Benchmark when I when I backed the team at Opinions that included Naval and others. Mm -hmm. And um, in some ways, Opinions reminds me John. Door was talking about Go and all the incredible people that were there, even though it wasn't iconic all and on its own. And, right. and Opinions was like that. There were so many great people there. And Sarah and Nerv were there. Um, and so they were actually EIRs in our office. They started a company called uh, Fanbase out of our office, which was intended to be a social network for sports. Um, three years in, it wasn't working. We knew it wasn't working. Um, and instead of quitting, uh, we, they scaled back to seven people and decided to ideate and sandbox and, and Mike Maples pivot. And um, one, of the, one of the team members said, there's this HOA that wants automation. You know, we should build a, a cheap, lightweight product to get them to try it. And the minute I heard the idea, I was like, oh, that's going to be very big. Like, I, and then the initial test of that one and the next ten were all phenomenal. And we just got super excited. I mean, it just felt like it was just rolling. And as a venture person, a lot of people think that a venture investor is not allowed to have fun or to you know, claim that they're involved. And I just get giddy like in my little spot on the sidelines. I'm not taking credit for doing any of this stuff, but I just like being around. And mm -hmm. you know, to be there at, at Open Table where you're going, you know, we can get a network effect if we can get enough restaurants and enough users when you have 10 restaurants. And to be there today when it's 10 million reservations a month and to have been there where you bet on it early, I just get like giddy, I get really high. And so this one, it means a lot to me. And I'm thrilled for the team because they had spent three years thinking you know, that they were going to fail and then all of a sudden turned it around and now they've got every venture investor on the world trying to knock on their door and get involved and, and um, read, Hay read um, Hoffman. Hoffman and thank you and David Z who, you know, obviously have been involved in huge social networks like insisted on investing and came in at a, at a nice healthy price and now is helping out and so it's been great and I'm really excited about the product. I think that it has way more utilitarian uh, accomplishments than other social networks that have come along, and I think that's going to give us a lot more um, opportunity to do things that other people haven't done. And they've done some clever stuff. I would have never guessed that getting tied up in government would have been helpful. I would have thought, oh, that's going to slow us down. And Nair yeah. said, Bill, just wait. Let me try it. And he's, and he's <laughs> killed it. Just killed it. So uh, anyway, that was very special. And that, that is how I got in, was from working with him before. And you guys are both Texas guys. We are. He's from Odessa. He went to the Friday Night Light School, Odessa <laughs> Permian. Hi, Bill. Uh, John Mardino. I wanted to know if you've been following the Bitcoin space at all, have any thoughts on that. And um, if you see a benchmark, maybe making any investments in that space. So we haven't made an investment yet. Um, we continue to look at a lot of stuff. At this point, I would have a hard time believing it's a, a non-consensus area to look at because everybody and their brother's looking at it. Um, I, we, we did like a day offsite on the topic, and I'll tell you where I came out, and maybe if someone's got an idea that fits with our perspective, it'd be great to talk to them. Um, I think if regulation weren't involved, it would be wildly successful. I think there are a number of places where people need money to move where today's alternatives don't work. And as a result, the asset would rise simply because it has utility. Now, unfortunately, some of those things that are most prone to needing that are things that are illegal. Um, and you know, it just is what it is, right? And you can imagine, I mean, you read these stories, these unbelievable stories of like the drug lord in Mexico who's got a hundred million dollars in cash under his bed. Mm -hmm. Now if he could, and, and they'll do things that have like a 20% conversion ratio to get the cash washed. Mm -hmm. So if he could move it to, you know, Amsterdam, even if it had a risk of a 20 or 30% loss, he'd put 10 million over there. And then mm -hmm. if he had to run, you could get to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think <laughs> that size of money needing something like that to me says, it, and of course there's all kind of other examples. What's happening now in the U.S. at least seems to be that because of money laundering rules, the only way you're going to be able to buy it in the U.S. is if everyone knows you're connected to it, which 
it interestingly takes away from the core point of the anonymity. Um, yeah. And so my punchline on it all is, you know, the venture investor that does well might be someone who's investing in a different country um, on a play where they're not subject to the same regulation we are. Um, you know, could you make money here? Maybe. I would need to get a better understanding of what the value proposition is if it's completely known instead of anonymous. Mm -hmm. And it's less clear to me what that is right now. Uh, maybe circumventing credit cards and the 2% there, but then you need it to be very stable because your risk of loss and your cost of entry right now is more than 2% to try and buy it. So long answer. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Benchmark has a somewhat unique structure in that you're all equal partners. Yeah. How does that dynamic play out on a day-to-day -day basis? Do you each own your individual companies, and how do you fire someone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, all good questions. So the, the way it plays out on a day-to-day -day basis, if you think about a firm that has a hierarchical structure, every time you raise a new fund, you're going to be arguing you deserve a bigger piece. And so if you have an incredible CEO or a great CFO candidate, you're not you're, you're probably going to try and get them into one of your companies as opposed to sharing them within the, the firm. And so one of the key benefits we think the structure provides is that everyone's equal and everyone participates the same. And so um, I remember, you know, I, I have tons of examples like this, but, you know, Zillow, you know, was interested in, in you know, something that Matt knew about. They were wondering about Facebook integration and whatnot. And so Matt went and visited them. I'm the board member. And uh, Yelp was worried, thinking about could they get an embedded deal with a telecom carrier. And Mitch had done all these deals that jammed at that way. And so he went over there even though it was Peter's company. And so it just encourages that amount of kind of sharing and team participation because we're all in it together and there's no favoritism. Um, it's very difficult to, to, to fire someone and, and I don't know that we actually ever have. I think the peer pressure of knowing that it's all shared equally causes people who have lost, you know, interest or focus or energy to bow out naturally is what we've seen. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So a couple more things for me. Um, first of all, you, one thing I meant to ask you about earlier, you, there's a huge pedestal of um, venture capitalists who have operational experience. Yeah. You don't have operational That's true. experience. That's true. Fred Wilson talked at length about with us about how he actually felt that was a disadvantage and if yeah. someone was going into the venture business, yeah. he would not advise them to take his same path. How do you feel about it? Advantage, disadvantage? I, I, I don't know that it's like a, the, the determinant variable of anything. And I would, so one way I would say it is, I think it's a really good background for which to potentially be a venture capitalist. But just because you've been an operator doesn't make you a natural candidate for a venture capitalist because the things you do are very different. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of backgrounds of the most successful venture capitalists, it's actually really random. There's people from all kind of lives, including my favorite, which is Michael Moritz's journalism background. Mm -hmm. um, but. And there's several from where I've come from, Danny Reimer and Mary Meeker and I used to all compete as, as sell side analysts years ago. And Ben Rosen was a sell side analyst. Mm -hmm. one of the, so there, there's been all these different backgrounds. And even with my own firm, Mitch Lasky's been an operator, Kevin Harvey's been an operator, Bruce has been an operator, but Peter and Matt and I, well, Matt was in a company, but he wasn't Not a kind founder, of founder yeah. CEO kind of thing. And so I, I don't think there's any data that says you have to be. And mm -hmm. there's plenty of great capitalists, venture capitalists to you know, icons like, like Dorr and, and Moritz that weren't. Mm -hmm. And so what I would say is this, you want if someone that's gonna be on your board to be a great board member. You know, you wouldn't hire a VP of marketing to run sales. Right. And it's possible that someone that comes from an operating background could be a great board member. And there are many examples of ones that have, but it's not definitive. One of, I, the ones that have made it, I've been told they're better board members four or five years in that they initially try and grab the wheel. Yeah. Way more than those of us who know we have no business operating do. Mm -hmm. um, just because that's, that's their tendency. Mm -hmm. And I've also found in the guys we've worked with that they assume themselves in the role making investment decisions mm -hmm. rather than analyzing whether the founder or the team is capable of the job on the field. Interesting. Yeah. And now I have my final two questions for All you. Right. You have actually watched these, unlike I'm some ready of the for guests. This, so yeah. you're ready for exactly. these. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. What is the one thing you believe that few people believe? 
Well, the one thing that I like and passionate about that I don't know that any other one else would say is, and I'm just kind of declarative, but I actually think I love being a venture capitalist more than any other venture capitalist that's out there. I think you might. Yeah, I really do. I just love it to death. I, I feel so lucky to be in doing what I'm doing. And I've said, and I, I can't prove this would be true, but I've said if we were in a socialist society where we all got paid the exact amount of money, I'd want to do this job. Mm -hmm. um, it just it just really something. And look, a lot of people have say really nasty things about my profession and you know, kind of is what it is, but for a personal standpoint, it's something I'm just super excited was it about. As, was it like you thought it would be? I mean, you spent your whole career trying to No, it's a little different. There, there's a lot more salesmanship than I expected. I think most people think that being a venture capitalist is sitting in a boardroom thinking up really smart strategic thoughts, and that may be 2% of the job. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's about 70 or 80% selling. Mm -hmm. um, whether you're pitching to get new entrepreneurs excited through your narratives and rhetoric <laughs> or, um, or trying to close a candidate, a lot of recruiting. You know, mm -hmm. it's like 40 or 50 percent recruiting mm -hmm. um, that you're doing. it. But anyway, I just I love I have ADD, so I can't do one thing. That's what I learned at Compact. I love being able to look at a bunch of different things. And I like being involved on the edge. I mean, the types of companies we're funding today are way different than 10 or 15 years ago. So mm -hmm. anyway, I declare myself the happiest venture capitalist in Silicon Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be something about basketball. Well, that could be too. That could be too. And I'll focus on something I know I'm good at as opposed to something I wanted to be good at. <laughs> um, if you could have one mediocre superpower, what yeah. would it be? It, this is easy for me. I, I, if I could, I would love to sing. I've loved music my whole life. <laughs> I have these quotes that I put on Above the Crowd. Um, I go see shows constantly. I'm at, I'm at the Fillmore like twice a week. Um, but I, I'm so tone deaf, it's not even funny. And if I try and sing, everyone yells at me. So that would be the one. Which is funny because Andy Ratcliffe always talks about how you sound like Elvis, not yeah. when you sing. Yeah, he hadn't heard me sing. <laughs> <laughs> I share that one. I love to karaoke and I cannot carry a tune. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's painful it's for sad. everyone. Yeah, oh well. It's, <laughs> it's what it is. I feel very lucky. We could go karaoke together sometime. Uh, we would make exciting. each other feel good. Let's not record it. <laughs> <laughs> um, this has been so much fun. Thank Big you so much for Big round of applause for uh, Bill Gurley, everyone. Thank you.